Welcome to the first ever Logan Center Blues Fest. My name is Lee Fagan. I'm Associate Director for University Arts Engagement here at the Logan Center. And we're thrilled to have everyone here tonight to kick off this brand new festival at the University of Chicago. First, I want to thank the Riva and David Logan Foundation, the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, for their tremendous support of this new series, and to Billy Branch for inspiring our adventure into blues programming here at the Logan Center. Also, a big thank you to the rest of the advisory committee who helped launch this first festival, especially Mike Kappas, who helped organize this evening's lineup. The conversation you're about to hear is part of a new effort to help archive the stories of blues musicians through this program series. And we're thrilled to kick it off with Alvin Bishop, who attended the University of Chicago back in the 60s. We couldn't be happier to have him back on campus with the Alvin Bishop's Big Fun Trio tonight after a set with Wee Willie Walker, Terry O'Dabby, and the Anthony Paul Soul Orchestra. Although Elvin Bishop has been performing for over 50 years, he is a vital and creative an artist as he was when he first hit the scene back in 1965 with the Paul Butterfield Trio Band here in Chicago. Make sure to come back Sunday afternoon to see him featured in the Midwest premiere of the documentary about the band, The Horn from the Heart, The Paul Butterfield Story. We're thrilled to have Elvin here tonight to help us kick off our conversation series with blues musicians over the next few years. Joining Elvin on stage will be Dick Sherman, a local treasure and blues historian who enrolled in the University of Chicago back in 1968. He is widely recognized in the blues community not only for his quality and care evident in his record productions and writings, but also for his love for the music and for the artists who sing and play it. Without further ado, I pass the microphone on to Dick and Elvin. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks to Lee and thanks to all of you to welcome to the inaugural, hopefully the first of many, Logan Center Blues Fests. And it's, it's always a treat to see Elvin and uh, talk to Elvin, but especially I'm happy tonight that I can reassure us all that this won't be a repeat of the last time that Elvin and I saw each other. That was at Blues on the Fox in Aurora in June, and the rain shaved an hour off his set out there. so. That's one thing we do not have to worry about tonight. So um, we've got a half an hour or so to uh, um, let Elvin dazzle us verbally as he, as he always does. And I thought we would focus on uh, three things in particular. One, just how Elvin got exposed to the, the music. And uh, then since we're in Hyde Park, this makes us a special occasion. We all know that's a big part of Elvin's history at the University of Chicago and and after, and then touched uh, to some extent, as time permits, on Elvin's uh, post-Chicago career, which is would be an illustrious Hall of Fame career even if he'd never been in Chicago. But uh, since he was here and we're here, we'll particularly celebrate that aspect. So let's start with how you got here, Elvin, and what was your early exposure to blues, and where did it happen? Uh, I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma, originally. And um, this was, uh, uh, I'm talking about the 50s. I was in high school, late 50s. And I liked uh, all the rock that was happening, you know. Uh, that's when rock and roll was actually first coming in with Chuck Berry and, and uh, Buddy Holly and Elvis and uh, Little Richard and Fast Domino and all that. I said, this is great, you know. But then I, I had this this old radio and uh, it was more like a piece of furniture. It was this big and had a record player down here set for 78s and a radio up here and tubes naturally, you know. And When I was supposed to be sleeping at night, I would turn that radio on real soft and get up next to it, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Tulsa's in, on the prairie. It's real flat. So 50,000 watt station from Nashville could get there easier from Acuna, Coahuila, Mexico. <laughs> And those, those were uh, blues stations. And I, one night I was just fooling around with it and I heard this thing coming through the static, you know, and there's that orange glow of those tubes and it was Jimmy Reed's harmonic. I said, oh shit, that's, that's it, that's it. <laughs> and this is where the good part of rock and roll was coming from. I just found out that, you know, all these people I mentioned before had a heavy blues background. Did you get to see much live blues coming through Tulsa? No. You, uh, it, was, it was, this was way before civil rights. 
and uh, it was strictly discouraged for uh, people of different races to get together, you know? I mean, physically discouraged. And yeah, didn't you tell me once you went to see Ray Charles and it was roped off? The, the yeah, scene? yeah, I did see him. Uh, I never got to see any hardcore blues, you know, but like they had a place called the Big Ten Ballroom, and sometimes for big shows like that, you know, they wanted the, the money, you know, so they would have uh, about, here's the, the ballroom right here, the front of it, and it goes all the way back here. And about this much, they would rope off for white people. And then the black people would be over there. And the rope stretched all the way from the front to the back, and you're supposed to stay on this side, you know. Were you starting to play guitar in Tulsa? I was starting to try to attempt to begin to learn. <laughs> uh, the, and it, it was pretty rough, though, because... Uh, nobody in my family was musical, and none of the neighbors knew anything about it, and uh, it was kind of like, uh, what's his name? The guy from Detroit said, working on mysteries without any clues, because, <laughs> and we didn't have no money, so I, the only guitar I could afford was I'd go to the pawn shop, and I'd get these old terrible K's and harmonies with the strings that far off the neck, you know, because I didn't know any better. And I try to play it. I said, damn, this guitar player is rough, you know. I'd, I'd give it up, and then I'd go back to the next dance at school, and i see the girls hanging around the guitar players. I said, wow, better get back on it, you know. <laughs> and uh, So what pointed you to Chicago? Well, I'll be honest with you, since there's not very many of us here, and we're all <laughs> close friends, and uh, nobody will tell anyway. Music was really was... I mean, the universe, college was my cover story <laughs> to get to where I knew the blues was, which is Chicago. I was lucky. I got a scholarship that I could basically go anywhere I wanted to, and I knew that blues was happening in Chicago. That's where Muddy Waters was and all the guys, you know, and because by that time I I got into, I'd go and uh, this one drugstore Skaggs Drugs in Tulsa would sell the records that came off the jukebox in the black part of town, you know. And they were all scratchy and wore out, but I didn't care. It was seven cents a piece. You can't go too far wrong, you know. And uh, I, I knew all about the guys, you know, and I'd send off to uh, Nashville. They had, they'd have these deals, you know. Yeah, it was a ra <coughs> Randy's. Randy Records yeah. in Gallatin, Tennessee, yeah. And they had these booklets that came with it, and uh, they'd have pictures, i say, oh, Muddy Waters' real name is McKinley Morganfield. I didn't know that. Chester Burnett, that's Howlin' Wolf. And I said, I got to get to Chicago. So I found out there was two main known colleges, you know, Northwestern and University of Chicago. I didn't know the difference. I just got lucky because University of Chicago turned out to be here on an island, which at that time was just in the middle of the South Side ghetto. Now the, uh, kind of hard to recognize the neighborhood after all these years because there's a lot more university and a lot more development and uh, no ghetto, so it's different. So it w was it 1960 that you got here? Yes. And um, <clears throat> you, t you told me that it was a co-worker on campus that uh, um, got you out into the local First, man, I tell happened. you what, within a week of the time I got here, I was down at Pepper's Lounge at 43rd and Vincennes seeing Muddy, the first, first blues band I ever saw. Muddy Waters, James Cotton, Otis Spann, Pat Hare, Willie Big Eye Smith, and a bass player. I made... I made, I said, damn, these blues bands are okay. And you, you said that was, be, that was because one of the people you worked with on campus. Well, your... no, see, uh, I stayed in a dormitory, and we ate at the cafeteria, and uh, somehow I got talking to some of the black dudes that worked at the cafeteria, and they were all blues fans. And I said, wow, that's great. You know, you, 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 did you ever see Muddy Ward? Oh, hell yeah, I saw him last week. Well, Wow, I said, you want to go? We'll take you, you know? And that, which is uh, 
pretty good way to do it, you know, just to go with a bunch of people that know the ropes, you know. Chicago wasn't dangerous like it is now. As dangerous, I'll put it that way. It was before gangs, and it was before the heavy dope. And it didn't have that bitter, desperate edge like it had. It wasn't the murder capital that it is now. Now, um, speaking of Muddy, I know one of the people who was a mentor to you here in may maybe some ways that uh, were man. quite totally straightforward, but that, that was uh, Sammy Lawhorn who was up frequently playing with Muddy. Was he at that first gig, or was that just Pat that time? Uh, it was Pat Hare. He was the only guy that Muddy would let sit down because he, he was just going to sit down. If you want him to play with you, you're going to let him sit down. He'd have that jacket hitched up over the half pint sticking out, you know, in the back. <laughs> now, Pat, Pat Hare is infamous among blues fans because he recorded a song called I'm Gonna Murder My Baby and then um, went up to Minneapolis for what was expected to be a short stay and not only fulfilled that prophecy but also shot the arresting officer and um, that short-circuited a plan that you had. Can you talk about that? Yeah. I was kind of got to talking to him and made friends, and he invited me to come over to his house, and he was going to show me some stuff, and then that was like right before they put him in jail. So it never happened. So there's, a, there's a lesson there. If somebody invites you over, take them up on it before they get locked up for life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can you talk about how uh, Sammy Lawhorn got you with Junior Wells to Junior's surprise, which is a surprise to you? Yeah. Sammy Lawhorn is a beautiful guitar player. He had a really neat style. And uh, he was playing with Junior Wells at uh, 39th and Drexel, the Blue Flame. And uh, I used to go over to his house in, in the Del Morocco Hotel, or not his house, but his, his room in the hotel, which is attached to the uh, Blue Flame. Great, right around the corner. Good chicken wings there, yeah. And uh, I'd go up to his room, and we'd practice and, uh, and fool around, you know. And then one, I went up there one day, he said, hey, man, you want to you wanna gig for two weeks with Junior Wells? I said, really? He said, this is before I got with Butterfield or anybody, you know. I was pretty green. And uh, he said, yeah, he wants you to come down and play with him. Go over there Tuesday. I'll teach you all the tunes, you know. And I learned the tunes as good as I could. And I went, I went Tuesday night. And I said, uh, hello, Mr. Wells, I'm, I'm here to play guitar with you. He said, you are. <laughs> he said, I said, yeah, I did. Uh, Sammy told me to, he, he did. <laughs> so he took me in the back and he, and he quizzed me on some of the tunes, you know, and he saw that I kind of halfway knew him anyway and it was too late for him to do any better. So I got to play the two weeks with him. And that was a big, that was a lot of fun. Now, another one of your mentors who you connected with uh, while you were, were here was uh, Little Smokey Smothers, and of course his cousin and great soul singer Lee Shot Williams lived with him too. Um, can you talk about how you met Smokey and what that evolved into? Smokey was uh, one of the most beautiful guys I ever met. Uh, I also played with uh, a guy, a, a, a great musician, Hound Dog Taylor, that there's a fellow sitting right here who had a pretty strong connection with him, too. Bruce Iglauer, the president of Alligator Records. Welcome, Bruce. So how did, so how did you connect with Smokey? And, and you're right, he was a wonderful, very generous um, person. I don't remember. It was just one of those things where it instantly clicked, you know. And me and this guy are going to be friends, you know, so... It was down at one of those clubs, you know. And he said, yeah, come on over to the house, you know. And I'd, I'd, I lived in the dormitory. Wait, which dormitory did you live in? Do you remember the name of it? The new dorm. Oh, okay. That's why I said the new dorm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you Thanks. go. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. And I, so I'd walk down. Smokey lived at 42nd in Berkeley. By the way, he lived... Lee Shot lived downstairs, oh, okay. and Smokey yeah. lived upstairs. And after they did that, the horrible, you know, 
destructive uh, urban renewal of the south side. I went down there in, sometime in the 70s and there was only two places left standing. One was uh, the club, you know, that uh, that uh, Buddy Guy had down there. Yeah, the checkerboard. The checkerboard. Yeah, and it's, and, and it's the other totally one was in 42nd too. and Berkeley. And hmm. Lee Shot was still downstairs and wow. Smokey was still upstairs. I'd walk from the new dorms with my guitar, carrying my guitar, and people would be, uh, at least they weren't shooting up, and they'd lean up, hey, Elvis, Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, closer than they knew. <laughs> so um, what kind of stuff was, did Smokey teach you, and what I, you've described his method for motivating well, all, you? All the two, you know, Chicago, the Chicago blues scene was huge, and it was a beautiful thing because... Uh, there was a lot of incentive for everybody to study and learn a lot of songs and, and, and learn more music because it went from 9 o'clock in the evening till 4 every night in the morning and 5 on Saturday. And I don't care who you were, <coughs> how big a star you were, you were glad to see somebody coming at 1 or 2 in the morning because you had all that time to fill up with it. So there was a lot of sitting in. Not only that, but it didn't pay that much in really a fluid scene because, you know, you're making $12 a night, somebody offers you 13 gone. <laughs> but, but you'd sit in and you learn all the guys' tunes that you could so that you'd make a good showing when you sit in. And if you sounded good with them, next time you need a guitar player, they'll call you. you know? So we would, we would learn all the tunes of all the jukebox and you know, all the, the southern blues hits and everything, you know. Smokey would, uh, he'd teach me the rhythm part first. Because, uh, uh, you know, that was a very low stage of development at the time. And he would learn the lead, and then when he got it pretty solid, he'd call in the neighbor and we'd play it for him. And that was a big thing. <laughs> Jukebox jury. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he took me out. Just, yeah, I was kind of hard-headed, you know, it's hard to catch on to some of those things. I was having too much trouble getting my part together. Can, can you guys hear? Okay. okay, yeah, you need to hold the mic. Yeah. You have too much, <laughs> if, he, if he was having too much trouble uh, teaching me the part, you know, he'd take me in the kitchen, he'd lift up the lid of the pot, he always had something going, it'd be <laughs> ham hocks and beans or neck bones and greens or something like that, you know, he'd say, smell that. I say, oh, that's good. Can I have something to slam that lid down? And when you get the part, you can have some. <laughs> well, we, we could talk about Smokey for the rest of this interview. Smokey and Elvin were, I, I tell a lot of people, everybody should have one friendship in their life like Elvin and Smokey did. Um, they were there for each other, some real important times, and um, just, you know, been through a lot together, shared a lot together, and um, they recorded a live CD together for Alligator. Um, <clears throat> in Smokey's last years, when his health was failing, Elvin gave him something to live for and a way to put some money in his pocket by pulling together a CD of performances of the two of them. And uh, it goes way, way beyond that. But it, it was a, truly a wonderful thing to witness. But I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about a couple of other people I know you used to play with around Chicago. And uh, one is Hound Dog. How much, how much did you work with him and what kind of places? Uh, you know, I'll tell you what. The Chicago blues scene, the time I spent on that, especially the first times, like going to Maxwell Street and just, uh, it was just so beautiful. It was like a dream come true. I never expected to get that lucky, you know. It's kind of like a, something that happened today. We checked in the hotel, 53rd and Harper, you know. It's uh, the Hyatt or something. And around the corner was a restaurant that I'd gone to, I used to go to when I was in Chicago, Valois. You guys probably know where it is. It's real cool. And I, I said, man, we got to go in there, you know. So after the sound check, we went in there, and the damn place hasn't changed a bit in 50-some years. It's unbelievable. And the food was still good. It was great. Although one, one thing has changed. Now it's the place Obama used to eat. So oh. 
that came up. You when asked when me one it. question and I answered a different one. Let's see. Now, what <laughs> no, was you, first that question? Was hound dog. What was hound, oh, hound, hound dog? Oh, hound dog. Yeah. Uh, I was getting ready to explain in my long-winded way that uh, you know the Australian Aborigines, anything that that's mythical to them that happened a long time ago, that is really uh, makes a big impression on them. They call it dream time. And the early 60s in Chicago are like dream time to me. I don't remember a lot of the specific details, but I really remember the feel of it, you know? I played with, with Hound Dog maybe two weeks at the most. These really low down places on the west side. And it'd be like, the picture I have in my mind is we were all set up on the floor. They didn't have, they didn't have stages, you know? And uh, Hound Dog would be sitting there and he had these long legs. They'd be sticking way up over his, he'd be sitting in his seat, you know, playing meet me in the bottom or something. And his pants were way up past his socks and everything, you know? And he would just jam it. We'd, we'd go to his house and um, to rehearse, so-called rehearsal. He'd, he'd, he'd send me to, to, to the store with $2 for a $3 half pint of whiskey, you know. <laughs> and I'd bring it back, and we'd sit there, and we'd go over three or four songs, and we'd go to the gig. We wouldn't play none of them. <laughs> just, just different shit, you know. Now, was, was he working without a bass player when you played with him? Or? Yeah, he had a guitar player. Uh, he had a guitar player and a drummer. Oh, I guess I was the guitar player. <laughs> and the, the other one I wanted to ask you about was uh, sax player J.T. Brown, who, by the way, you probably know was Luther Tucker's uncle. I know. I didn't know that. Yeah. Is that right? Huh. Yeah, he's he kind of like, uh, J.T. Brown looked like, uh, you ever see that old cartoon character, Droopy the Dog? <laughs> yeah. He was... Um, he got mad at me when I took that gig with uh, Junior Wells. I, I told him, I got on my nerve and told him I was going to make the change. And uh, he said, how much is he paying you? I said, $12 a night. He said, because JT was paying me 10 you know. And uh, he said, I thought all the musicians were supposed to was enough clothes to get it, enough money to get his clothes out to cleaners, you know. <laughs> Well, you're lucky he paid you anything, considering his, his reputation. Uh, he was a piece of work. <laughs> the, na the nanny goat horn. Huh? <clears throat> the nanny goat horn, that's what they used, used to call yeah. it. Well, let's, uh, let's talk a, more about uh, the, your experiences playing the, the campus, and particularly, um, let's talk about the twist parties. Now, was that with Butterfield, or were you doing that before Butterfield? Uh, it was when me and Butter knew each other and we jammed together at the time. It was before he got his band together. We had, I played with different outfits. We had one called the Southside Olympic Blues Team because it was just kind of like different personnel every gig we'd get, you know, which was damn few, just parties at people's houses, you know. And had another one called the Salt and Pepper Shakers, and we actually had some real gigs and clubs and stuff. And, but it, the twist parties were great. They had uh, jazz guys would play there. Little Walter came and jammed with us one time. Uh, a, a lot of good musicians. Where, where were those? Ida Noyce Hall. Do, is that still happening? Yeah. Was, was that little room near the door on 57th, or was it a bigger... Pardon me? Do you remember where it was in the Ida Noise? Was it wasn't it? very far from the new dorms, I know that. And wait, how did you first connect with Paul Butterfield? First day I was in Chicago. He was just uh, sitting in front of a house playing blues on the guitar, and drinking a quart of beer, and that was Looked like my type of fellow. I wonder if we made friends with him. <laughs> so when, when, and where, when and where after that did you, did you two start uh, work? 
playing together. Uh, Hyde Park was a real cool neighborhood. Uh, this, like I said, this is before civil rights, and there wasn't much mingling going on, basically anywhere, but more so in in Hyde Park. I think it was more like maybe New York City or something, because there was a lot of uh, house parties and uh, like sort of off-campus type of things, you know, and. Uh, we, we used to just go and jam acoustic him and uh, see Nick Gravenitis and uh, Big Joe Williams. When, uh, you, when Smokey, Little Smokey had his review at the Blue Flame that Paul um, would work with, and Lee Shot told me all the horn players hated having a harmonica player with them, the usual dynamic. <laughs> um, where, did you see that, and were you ever a part no, of it? No, I never saw I never even, uh, this is the first I heard about it. Yeah, I thought Smokey said that. Dick knows just, his stuff. Uh, He's, uh, he, he used to take a tape recorder around to all the blues clubs, and didn't you live in Howell and Wolf's basement well, for a while or something? Not, not quite, but close. By the way, I, I'm going to get on my soapbox for one minute. There's all this talk about Muddy's house, and deservedly so. It should be preserved. Wolf's old house at 88th and Cottage is in great shape. Nobody ever says boo about preserving it. So maybe someday they'll figure out it's there before it's, it's too late. Um, well, eventually, you replaced Smokey with, with the Butterfield Band. How did that come about? I never knew Smokey was in Butterfield's band. You know, have you heard the stuff he recorded with them? No. Yeah, I think it says it was 64. Swedish radio came and did a bunch of recordings of Chicago blues artists. And Is that right? I think they did it at the Sutherland, but um, like seven or eight songs. It's been on a bunch of, of bootleg albums. Is that right? Yeah. How's I'll, it sound? I'll, I'll send, I'll send you that. sound good a bit, huh? Yeah, it's, you know, if, I mean, I, most most people would agree that it didn't have the that whatever you guys had, the extra zap of electricity in it. But it was cool to hear and cool to hear Mm -hmm. um, it was Smokey, Jerome, and Sam, I, I think. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's certainly a real thing band for him to, to record with. Uh, speaking of that, you, you said you, your first record was the one you recorded uh, with three harmonica players. Can you talk about that? It was in some building uh, on campus. It was about 1962, I think. And uh, this guy, Norman Dayron, he had a, one of those reel to reel wall and sack reel to reel ones he said you guys want to hear what you sound like on tape so me and james cotton and butterfield and billy boy arnold went over there and i had this um dobro it's a cool guitar i got it at pawn shop on 63rd street you ever see those hawaiian ones they got a neck about this big and they play it on their lap Somebody had taken a pocket knife and shaved that whole neck down to where it was just a regular guitar. It had a great sound for blues. The, the, uh, the G string, this is more information than anybody but a guitar player needs, is, was a, was, the G string was, was an A string with the winding taken off of it. Yeah, well, those were the old days when people unwrapped their strings or used a banjo string. Man, I, I like saw, you, you ever see this guy pop a stovepipe that, yeah. that was on Maxwell Street? I saw him playing one time, and he popped an E string. He just unwound it, tied, tied it, it together, yeah. and, <laughs> and put the capo up above the place where he tied it and just went on playing, you know? But you, you don't call it, they didn't call it a capo, they call it a clamp. And, and it was a, a pencil with a big rubber band around it. <laughs> That's what you use for a capo, yeah. Another group that I know you worked with was uh, Baby Huey and the Babysitters. Now, a former babysitter, Deacon Jones, who played organ with Freddie King for a long time, and John Lee Hooker just passed away. Were you in that band at the same time? Yeah, yeah. He was, Deacon wrote a book a couple of years ago, he said, he said, I blew it. Uh, I used to give uh, Elvin Bishop a ride down to Peppers to see Muddy Waters. He said, I think he liked it going down there with me because uh, Peppers was all black and Elvin was all white. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was an interesting place where I met Bruce, by the way. Um, 
Are there any other people you remember working with particularly f fondly from those, those early days here when you were just finding your blues footing? Uh, not, not so much working with, but maybe jamming with or, or hanging out with or meeting. Otis Rush was real nice to me. Every, all the musicians were nicer than they had to be, nicer than you would think they would be because uh, when I started out, Blues was almost 100% black, the audience. Blues was the living music of the black people like, like uh, hip hop is today. Now, if you get 1% black, you're doing good. Yeah, but you're, you're right though that the elders were so accepting and, and so generous and you know, I, I ran into probably what you ran into, people were just way nicer to me than there was any any call for them. You, you wouldn't have expected and, it, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's part of what makes us so dedicated to it is um, you appreciate that people were yeah. so willing to, to take you in, even though in some ways we probably represented what they'd spent their whole life struggling against, at least visually. Um, but yet, you know, they would look, look out for us all night, make sure we got to the whatever our transportation was okay, and you know, whatever musical questions we had, nobody ever said, oh, no, no, don't tape record me. Guys were great about that. But when the first time I tape recorded Wolf, I was reassuring him on the way home that I wasn't going to do anything with it. I just had all his records and couldn't get enough of his recordings. And he said, oh, that's too bad. I was hoping you'd sell it and make yourself some money. So, <laughs> <laughs> so was uh, Butterfield the first real road work you did, or did you go out with people before him? Uh, well, I, w I went out to a light and polite extent with the Baby Hugh and the Babysitters. We went to Indiana, and then uh, I went with Smokey a couple of times. We used to just play, uh, me and him and Lee Schott, and uh, one, of, one of us, we didn't have a bass, we'd run the guitar string an octave down and play bass on that. We played, uh, oh, we had some gigs. I remember one time we went to Milwaukee and played for the Cafeteria Workers Union. <laughs> they had a big dance, that was cool. I assume the food was good. Huh? <laughs> I assume the food was good. <laughs> yeah. At what point did you start really thinking that this Butterfield thing was going somewhere? Where, where you were, were you working and what kind of things were you seeing uh, that Every step of the way was such an improvement over where I was coming from and such an unexpected, beautiful development. I, you know, I've never been able to predict anything. It's all a big surprise to me. There, there must have been a time, though, when you, <coughs> you sort of realized you weren't, you know, one of the, the blues bands scuffling to find a, a job on Wednesday night anymore. Was that Big John's where you started noticing or well we had a, we had a six night a week gig for two years man and that was that was great to me making 25 dollars a night and by the way speaking of butterfield i do want to introduce one more audience member john anderson is here and he he is responsible for the film horn from the heart about paul butterfield which is being screened on sunday so let's hey, hey. welcome john i hope you guys will take a look it's very very enjoyable Wow. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, the question was, how about the fret shop, Out of which the was a music past, store in Hyde Park? Yeah. I remember that. That was a cool place. It was, it was kind of run by old, uh, the folk establishment in those days were like, oh, I don't know what you call them, wobblies, I guess they were. <laughs> Is that what it was? Yeah, yep. the old-time communist workers' party type of people, you know. Woody Guthrie, this land is my land. And um, you know, we've got about three minutes left, and uh, the only other question I was really going to ask Elvin was what took him out of Chicago, but I think I'll save that one just in case. But give a chance. We've gotten some good audience questions, so let's see if you guys have a couple more. Does anybody... Dave, Dave Waldman back there, one of the city's best harmonica players, also guitar, mandolin, piano. The question was Elvis' Little interaction Walter? with Little Walter. I saw him, I think, <coughs> maybe three times. 
And uh, I always kind of thought that he maybe found out about cocaine before the rest of it. <laughs> and he was always kind of a like, a, he, he wasn't the type of guy that, that would thrive in a, a white setting, you know what I mean? He was a ghetto guy. And, uh, but he was a hell of a musician. He played some stuff, I heard him play some stuff live that wasn't on any of his records and was just way, way beyond any, anything I ever heard any other harmonica player do. Uh, he was a hell of a guy. He was one of two musicians in Chicago that were so respected that they didn't have to ask if they could sit in. They could just jump up on anybody's bandstand at any time and take over. Him and Earl Hooker. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll usurp that last question, just ask you to talk for a minute about Earl, Earl Hooker. I agree with you, he was by far the most charismatic and <clears throat> admired. Guys didn't even argue about who was number one around here, it was just who, maybe, who, <clears throat> maybe who was number two, but nobody was gonna mess with him. What, what do you remember, what, was, what impression lingers about seeing and hearing him? Uh, he, he just has such a great instinctive feel for, for the slide. His, his slide playing just killed me. I, I remember I saw him one time, he, like I said, he jumped up on the stage. This is one, it, it was with like Little Mac or one of those guys, you know, or Detroit Junior maybe. It was, it was the type of guys that played on Tuesday and Wednesday at, at Peppers, you know. And he called out, he called for uh, what I say is when that was happening, you know? And he started playing it, and I swear you could close your eyes and just see Ray Charles singing it. It was, he was so, and he, it seems in my mind that they played it for 45 minutes, but he obviously didn't do that, but he played it a long time and the ideas just kept flowing, something new, you know, he, he just seemed bottomless. I, I always thought he was the most vocal sounding of any Guitars, and they this say is, blues guitar is, is about a vocal sound. If, if so, he was the master. 90, 99% of slide players either play G tuning, which makes them sound like, you know, the Robert Johnson, Wolf kind of, you know, area. And it's, it's like a little trap, as is the E tuning, which makes them sound like Elmo James. And he, he just, he had a small slide, he put it on his little finger. Most guys put the slide on their, somewhere uh, in the middle so they have the, they can support it with this other one because it's kind of unwieldy to get used to, you know? It's a heavy thing on your finger. He used the lightest slide he possibly could and that left him three fingers to right. play. Yeah, he made a point of showing me that too, that he used a short one so he, he could fret with yeah, his other yeah, fingers. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and he never retuned. He, uh, it took me so long to tune, I didn't want to stop in the middle of the show. I said, that's a great idea. <laughs> it's, you just got to take a little more time and, and find where the, listen to it. Otis showed me some great stuff about how to play vocally. He, he put on an Aretha Franklin record and he'd say, yeah, that's, that's the melody you're playing, but you're not playing it like she's singing. She started out down below and brought it up and then she's trembling, it, you know, and I said, okay, I got to, you know. Yeah, even without a slide, I think Otis maybe had the best feel for Earl's slide playing of any other guitar player that, that I have ever knew. It was great, because he, he still got three fingers, which is more than Django Reinhardt ever had, you know? Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, well, we've, we've got a great show I, I had tonight. Um, Anthony Paul and his orchestra are absolutely wonderful. My, my lady friend Nora, who's here somewhere, and I spent a few days with them in Italy in July, and... It was awesome, and they're supplemented by some terrific vocalists, Terry O'Dobby and Wee Willie Walker, plus some of the best background vocalists in Chicago. So um, between that and Elvin, we've got a heck of a musical night ahead. So I'm gonna let people get ready, but first let's thank Elvin again. It's always a lot of fun getting into the way back. Thank you. Thanks, Dick. Welcome back to your roots. <laughs> <laughs>